Good morning. Glad to see everybody. We hope that you've had a great week. Uh, man, we're going to have an awesome day in the house of the Lord this morning. We're glad that you're here. Uh, if you're uh, visiting with us, you're an honored guest this morning, and we're thrilled and stoked to have you here this morning as well. We're going to start our services off this morning with Mighty to Save. Let's stand together. Let's get our worship on this morning. Here we go. Sing with me. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me just as you find me. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Yes, I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King, Jesus. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King, Savior. He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. You're my Savior. You can move the mountains. Come on. God, you are mighty to save. You are mighty to save forever, author of salvation. You rose and conquered the grave. Yes, you conquered the grave. You are mighty to save. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Eddie Coffey. I'm one of the deacons here at High School Baptist Church, and uh, along with the rest of the deacons, our minister Dan and our pastor Brian, we'd like to welcome you this morning. We're grateful that you are here. And just got a couple uh, little things on your bulletin. We have a connection section. It's a little tear-off thing that you can tear off through your name, put them in the boxes on the back on your way out so we can uh, know who you are. Uh, the next two things, that's adult bulletin. We have a age three and up children's bulletin with a little coloring page. There's crayons and uh, entry way out here. Then for uh, David Humphrey, we have ages seven and up. So you may pick that up or, or uh, 
Maybe Roxanne will get you one. And uh, so, once again, glad you're all here this morning. We'll just enjoy yourself with the Lord. Who's next? Thank you, Eddie and David Humphrey. Bless your heart. You just get skewered over that every Sunday, don't you? Bless your heart. One of these days you'll get it right and start coloring in the lines. So anyway. Thank you, Eddie. We appreciate that. We're going to start things off with stand up. Let's sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Here we go. Blessed Assurance. week so we're going to sing it again just so everybody gets to gets to know a little bit wonderful song by Bethel worship called the goodness of God Until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have 
of God as we look at Psalm 123 it says I lift my eyes to you the one enthroned in heaven and like a servant's eyes are on his master's hand and like a servant girl's eyes are on her mistress's hand so our eyes are on the Lord our God until he shows us favor his goodness his mercy his love his power his compassion poured out in our lives and so we cry out today show us favor Lord show us favor for we've had more than enough contempt. We've had more than enough scorn from the arrogant and contempt from the proud. Make your prayer today. Show us the goodness of God. Show us your favor, Lord. Let's pray, and then we'll continue on in worship. Father God, all my life you have been so, so good. And with every breath, Lord, I want to praise your name right here today. I want to cry out to you, Lord, show us favor. Show us favor. We, we see in the psalm, God, it says, show us favor, Lord. We know that that is your personal name and we have your personal name because you have a personal relationship with us. Father God, show us the favor of a child of God. I pray over our worship that we have the rest of this time together I, I pray lord that we would sense your favor your goodness because god that is our story it is our story that we as sinners as humans as flawed people still experience the goodness of god that you are in fact mighty to save and continue to pour out your might and your goodness on us the rest of our days. May we taste that goodness this morning. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. 
Well, as we continue on in worship today, I do want to point you to a couple things we've got going on here in our church and in our church uh, family. And so the, the first one is that today is the final day for our Lula Durham missions offering. We've been taking this up for local missions opportunities for the last few weeks. Uh, this is the artist formerly known as our uh, Above and Beyond offering that we use for local uh, missional needs in our community right here in Lake Sturgeon Garrett County. Uh, we have renamed that, rebranded that, the Lula Durham Local Missions Offering to give it a greater connection to the rest of our missions offerings. And so I encourage you today, uh, grab an envelope out of our main welcome center and uh, drop uh, your, your offering in for that in the offering boxes if you haven't done it yet. Uh, we want to make sure that we are giving sacrificially as a church so that we, we may then in turn give it sacrificially as a church body to those in need here in our community. And so all of the money that goes to our Lula Durham local missions offering, 100% of that turns right back around and goes into our community uh, helping those in need right here in our backyard. And so I encourage you uh, to give to that if you have not. Here in just a little bit, uh, we are going to head over into the Fellowship Hall once we continue worshiping in here uh, and go to our youth mission trip meal. Uh, the youth group actually and their leaders are right now preparing us a little spaghetti dinner and whatnot. Uh, I know I'm looking forward to it. I wore a white shirt for just for the occasion today. So uh, I'm living dangerously. And uh, we're going to go right over there after worship. So I encourage you, if you don't have lunch plans, please hang loose here at church. Eat with us, fellowship with us over in the fellowship hall. If you do have lunch plans, cancel them and stay anyway. Uh, you know, let the crock pot run at the house. It'll be all right. I'm the only person that can burn something in a crock pot. So I believe in you. Uh, we'd love for everybody to stay and help support our youth group as they're heading out on a missions trip in July. I'm excited to see what God's going to do through them over in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and uh, western Virginia. Not West Virginia, Western Virginia. And so uh, excited for that and that we get to support them today at that meal. And then tonight we, we get to come back, Lord willing, at, at 6 o'clock. And uh, hear from Christian Davis. He is going to come and uh, lead us in a worship concert. He has got a, a voice that I'm all kinds of jealous of. Uh, I sing like a bullfrog that's been hit by a four-wheeler. And so uh, you go ahead and work with that mental image if you like. And <laughs> he is the opposite of me. The dude's got a great voice and a, even more so a heart for the Lord and his people. And uh, he led us in worship about this time last year on a, a Sunday night. It was a powerful, wonderful time. And uh, I'm looking forward to him coming back tonight and uh, sharing with us some more. And uh, we'll be taking up a love offering at the end of that time just to help support his ministry as he continues going throughout the United States, leading churches just like us in worship. And so uh, looking forward to having him tonight. And I'm still kind of jacked up because we had a great vacation Bible school training uh, yesterday. I'm going to tell y'all, if you were not here, there was dancing. There were lights spinning around. There were games being played. There were worship pastors jumping pews. It was chaos in a Baptist church. It happened. And to tell us a little bit more about what's going on with kids ministry and vacation Bible school, Amy Gaffney is going to come up and share with us on that. And we just want to thank everybody again that came out yesterday for the training. Um, if you weren't able to attend, I do have handbooks for each volunteer that's going to be volunteering at Vacation Bible School. If you can just see me at some point so I can get that to you. So everybody is on board and ready to go as soon as all the kids arrive because it will be great chaos when they come. <laughs> um, couple things uh, regarding VBS out here in the, what you call it, main entryway? I, I call it the foyer, main oh. entryway. Okay. Um, I have a couple of different things that I've put out there. We have flyers for Vacation Bible School. If you can just take one, hang it up at your favorite coffee place, your place of business, pass it to your neighbor, whatever you want to do. Um, we also got some little slips of paper. They have little pencils on them. It says pencil us in for Vacation Bible School. You can also take those and pass them out in the community to different kids, grandkids, neighbors, anybody that wants to come to VBS. Um, there's also prayer calendars that are out there. They're 30-day prayer calendars. We're about 30 days out from Vacation Bible School today. If you 
can't volunteer or even if you are a volunteer if you could at least be in prayer for vacation bible school it tells you just a little thing to pray for each day um, if you can grab one of those and just start praying for us as we continue to prepare for vacation bible school one other thing that's out there you may have already seen it there's three bright green posters um, that's a listing of everybody that's helping with vacation bible school if you can just take a look at that poster and make sure we have you signed up for the correct place that you wanted to be if you're not um, we did have a mass telethon and we may have put you in the wrong place just see me we'll get you in the right place we also still have just a few positions open um, so if you are still just wanting to volunteer for vacation bible school again see me we will get you on the list and we'll get you in a place thank you guys so if you haven't figured out <clears throat> the worship pastor jumping the pews yesterday was me um, so we played this game where we're all sitting in this, this thing, uh, this middle section here, and the front part had uh, purple balloons and the back half had red balloons, and the game was you were supposed to hit as many balloons of your color on the other side. Some of you may know I'm a little competitive, a little competitive. I'd rather chew my arm off than lose to you. So what do I do? I get right up here in the front of the line, and I stand on this pew, and I start rejecting balloons back and forth until I hit a saint of God and I hit Sally Watkins right in the face <laughs> with a red balloon and I apologized to her, I apologized to my God and I sat right back down. Before Brother Brian comes, let's stand to do one more. This, I love this song, Through It All by Hillsong. Here we go.
we sing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. One more time, come on. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I'll sing to you, Lord, a hymn of love. For your faithfulness to me, I'm carried in everlasting arms. You'll never let me go through it all. Thank you. Starting in the 15th and 16th centuries, tales of a legendary city of gold or cities of gold started to spread throughout parts of what was being called New Spain, or as we know it now, Mexico. See, the Spanish had come to the New World and they had established themselves in, in uh, this new land and they started hearing all of these rumors and they, they went by different names. They went by Cibola, which is to mean the seven cities. They went by El Dorado, and they, they heard of these legendary places, these legendary cities of gold. And these rumors circulated around New Spain over and over and over again until a guy with one of the coolest, most baseball player names that ever existed, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. And when Coronado, the... Spanish explorer and conqueror heard about El Dorado. When he heard about Cibola, he said, well, I am going to go find that joint. Homie's about to get a flat screen TV. I am ready. I'm going to the city of gold. And so he took him a, a gang of, of explorers with him, conquerors, soldiers, whoever he had, and he left out to go find this city of gold. And his journey took him from Mexico up into what is now the continental United States. And for the first time ever, a non-Native American laid eyes on the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River. And he thought, well, that's, that's pretty. That ain't a city of gold, though. And he carried on eastward, following the path that he had been told to follow to find this supposed city of gold, this Cibola that he was looking for. And it led him up across mountain ranges that we now know are part of the Rocky Mountains. It led him through deserts. It led him through plains until finally he ended up in Kansas. And he learned quickly that there are no cities of gold in Kansas. But merely a small town, a small native village of little adobe huts that had been renamed by a, another Spanish group, Cibola. The rumor had gotten back to him that this little native village was full of gold, and all it was full of was locals. See, the pursuit of rewards drives all kinds of things in this life. It drove Coronado to leave Mexico to pass by the Grand Canyon without batting an eye and go to Kansas. It's a pretty big reward you're seeking. It also drives up, I mean, just the, the very nature of human psychology is, is based around reward. In our brains, we have neurotransmitters that are constantly firing different chemicals, and one of them, dopamine, is, is 
what brings the feeling of reward, of satisfaction into our lives. And we as human beings naturally seek more of this dopamine so that way we feel good. That's why they call it the reward center of the brain. We seek after it in a number of different ways in our social life. We hang out with the people we like, doing the things that we like to do. Why? Because it's enjoyable. It's rewarding. We go to work. Why? So we get a paycheck. That's rewarding. That's enjoyable. Why do we get good grades in school? So that way we don't get grounded and we avoid losing our reward. chores at the house so her wife says good job and doesn't fuss at us right yeah. here's our main idea today as we hit our season finale of Luke those who trust the risen king reap the rewards of his kingdom those who trust the risen king reap the rewards of his kingdom we're going to be in Luke chapter 18 today, starting on page 930 in your uh, pew Bibles. If you don't have one, we'd love for you to take that as our gift to you. Um, but Luke 18, it may not be 930 in your Bible if you brought your own, by the way. Just a little heads up. Luke 18. Are y'all out there? Y'all are awful quiet today. We here? Luke 18, starting in verse 1, says, Now Jesus told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. This is not a good dude. And a widow in that town kept coming to him, saying, Give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he was unwilling. But later he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I'll give her justice. So she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect, to his people, who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay in helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes on the earth, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. So as he's continuing telling the parable, we got some self-righteous homies up in the crowd. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you know the Pharisees and religious leaders, they've been with Jesus almost every week. We've been in Luke of late, and it's a similar thing goes on. They start being self-righteous. Jesus has got an answer for that. Here's his answer today. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, a traitor to his nation. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Can you imagine praying that prayer and being like, Glad I'm not like that, dude. I fast twice a week, which was not even required. That was more than the Jewish custom recommended. I give a tenth of everything that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest, saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. People were bringing infants to him, so he might touch them, blessing them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him and said, get the kids out of here. Jesus, however, invited them. Let the little children come to me, which if I could pause right there. That is why we believe in free rage families at this church. That is why the sound of a baby crying in a worship service or the sound of kids playing in the pews is a good sound. As far as I can help it, this will never be a church where the little children cannot come. It's crucial. And the reason it is is because Jesus says, Let the little children come to me and don't stop them, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. A ruler asked him, who must have been hanging around, Good teacher, what must I do 
to inherit eternal life. And Jesus turns around and says, well, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Kind of a little, must be, must be either nailing it or you're more right than you realize, buddy. And then Jesus turns around and says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Just rattling off some of the Ten Commandments. And the ruler says, I've kept all these from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said, well, then you still lack one thing. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because the man was very rich. Seeing that he had become sad, Jesus said, how hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it asked, then who can be saved? He replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, look, we've left what we had and followed you. And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, there's no one who's left a house, wife, brothers, sisters, parents, or children because of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more at this time in this life. Which if we could pause for a second, that is important. There is immense blessing for the Christian in this life. It is meant to be a life of abundance, not financially, clearly. But a life of abundant blessing in this life through the Lord. This life is meant to be beautiful when following Jesus. And then he says an eternal life, even more, even more abundance in the age to come. Then he took the twelve aside and told them, see, we're going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked, insulted, spit on. And after they flog him, they will kill him, and he will rise on the third day. Obviously talking about himself there. They understood none of these things. The meaning of the saying was hidden from them. They did not grasp what he said. They were not tracking, and of course we know that they had no idea what was coming. And so we're going to dive into this means to trust in the risen king and to reap the rewards of his kingdom but before we do let me pray for you you pray for me and then we'll get in on it father god i i pray this morning over us as we explore this passage as we explore chapter 18 here in the book of luke and i i pray lord that we would have our faith be focused on the right person and that one be the risen king of jesus I pray, Lord, for anyone in here this morning whose heart has not yet softened to the good news, has not yet softened to the gospel. I pray for anyone here today who has not proclaimed your name. Lord, save them now. Work in their heart. Bring them to repentance. And I pray that as your spirit works, that they would not reject it. Reject it. I pray, Lord, that you would convict anyone in here this morning who maybe claims your name, maybe has been saved, and yet their life does not reflect the truths we see here. I pray for myself. I pray for the rest of us, Lord. Help us to live faithfully, trusting in you rather than in ourselves. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. We see here in this passage a repeated refrain telling us to trust in Jesus. And I think the key verses for us in this whole section I just read comes with the blessing of the children in verses 15 through 17 where it says the people were bringing kids to him, Jesus invited them in, and he said, let the little children come to me and don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I truly tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Talking about this idea of childlike faith. And if you've been in church more than a hot minute, you've heard it referred to as such. Having faith like a child. One commentator put it that we are to be totally dependent on God like a child. That we are to be fully trusting in the Lord like a child. That we are to be frankly open like a child. Some of y'all know children are quick to be open 
with what they feel. We're to be completely sincere, like a child. If you've spent any time around a kid, you know they are quick to trust. They're also quick to tell you what they think, whether you want to hear that or not. I was in my student teaching up at Paint Lick and maybe standing in not the most flattering position. And I had one of the little second graders come up to me and said, I see a baby. And I said, now look here, you little fella. <laughs> and you're thinking, yeah, he told that joke right here. <laughs> yep. It's not a joke. It happened. <laughs> Kids will say whatever they mean. Because they are brutally sincere. And he wasn't trying to be rude. He was just saying stuff. Doesn't know any different. And kids are quick in the same light to trust. The same kid as we'd be going down the hallway would just grab my hand. And I'd been there like a week. And he's already like, yep, that guy seems safe. I'll, I'll trust him. Childlike faith is... Trusting and open. As we see in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 1, it talks about faith and what it means to have childlike faith in slightly different terms. It says in verse 1 that now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. It's to hope for what is not there that we don't see it is there but we don't see it physically a kid trusts in an adult a kid is open with an adult even though they cannot prove that that adult is worth being open or trusting toward that's why we as adults must protect our children right we have to make sure that we set up safeguards at church and at home and at schools wherever to be as safe for our kids as possible because they're not going to do it on their own they'll open the door for a stranger and welcome right on in They'll trust anybody. Hebrews 11.6 continues talking about faith, and it puts it this way. Now, faith, now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then it describes what faith is. Since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists, it's to believe that God exists, and that he rewards those who seek, seek him. It's not just to believe that God exists. Remember, the demons believe that God exists. That is not saving faith. Saving trust in God is not God exists. Jesus exists. Jesus died on the cross. To just believe those truths is not saving faith. The demons believe all those things happen. And they are not saved. Saving faith goes deeper and it says those things happen and therefore he is my Lord and my King, the one who gives rewards and blessing to me, his people. That is saving faith. And so then we come back to Luke 18. And we see that true faith totally and completely trusts in God's existence and his rewards for seeking him. And so then how do we do that? What rewards are coming our way? What does that mean? Because I've already pointed out, it's clearly not actual wealth, right? You've heard me speak before against the, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospels that are so popular on your TBN preachers. They're going to tell you about how to live your best life now. They're going to tell you about their private jets. They're going to tell you that if you'll just give in four gifts of $19.99, you'll get a prayer cloth and immense blessing on your life. Charlatans. Liars. Frauds. It's not the gospel. Jesus never promises financial wealth for your faith. But he does promise reward in your faith. So what are we looking at? First of all. When we trust the king, we will see that he rewards the faithful with justice. When we trust the king, he rewards the faithful with justice. And we see that in verses 1 through 8, where the, the parable talks about the unfaithful judge and the widow. And the purpose of this parable is key. Verse 1, he says that it is a parable told to them for to pray always and not give 
up. The goal of Jesus talking about the unfaithful judge and how he eventually would give in to the widow was that his followers would pray always to a God who is bound to be more just than an unfaithful, unjust judge. The goal of telling that parable is that we would trust that God is better than an evil judge. And if we truly believe that God is, and I think most of us in this room, most of us hearing my voice on the radio or Facebook, they're going to acknowledge, right, that God is certainly more just than an unfaithful judge. That we should therefore be praying to Him, seeking Him to work in justice. But in order to see that, we have to actually ask Him. We have to be persistent in our prayers. If I took, and I thought about doing this, but I wasn't confident enough in my own abilities. If I took a Nerf basketball goal, and I took the suction cups, and I slapped it right there on the back of the baptistry, and I took a Nerf basketball, and I started throwing it over my head, what do you think the chances are I'm going to hit that basketball into that hoop? Zero. It is very low odds that I'm going to just like, whoop, and it's going to go through that hole. But I bet you if I stood here all day and I consistently just kept throwing it up, throwing it up, I'm eventually going to hit that. Now, I thought about doing it where I would turn around and shoot it, but I wasn't confident enough in my, my game for that either. But you, the point is we wouldn't quit on just one. I wouldn't throw the ball over my head, watch it fall into the baptistry, climb in there, dig it out, be like, well, I guess that's an impossible task. There's absolutely no way that I could ever get that basketball to go over my head and into that hole. It didn't happen on the first try. There's no way it's possible. I saw a video this week of a guy with a plunger, went up to a Dave and Buster's, and he went outside the Dave and Buster's, and he flung that plunger up in the air and stuck it on the sign at the Dave and Buster's. Now, first of all, I don't know who's getting up there to get the plunger down. Secondly, I can't imagine that Dave and Buster's was real thrilled about it. But third, I can almost guarantee you he didn't do that on the first try. The video said he did, but you all know he did. That takes persistence. Because even if he did somehow hit it on the first try, that wasn't the first time he'd flung a plunger at a sign either. I mean, it's been practicing. That's a weird thing to practice, by the way. But I don't have time to talk about that. Here's the point. We must pray with persistence. Far too often, we as Christians come to our good judge, the one who wants to deal justice in this world, and deal it swiftly, as it says here, the one who is mobilizing his church to work for the good of the nations. And we'll come with one prayer. Or a Hail Mary every six weeks. Lord, I pray that you would do da 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 da. And when we don't see it within 15 minutes, we say, well, I guess the answer was no. And then we carry on with life. And I know it is easy to give up. Maybe you've prayed in the past about a health concern that wasn't healed immediately. You prayed for someone who was sick, and they stayed sick or got sicker. Maybe they even passed away, and they're not here anymore. Maybe you prayed for some act of justice to happen in your life or in the culture, and it didn't happen. Maybe it even got worse. And maybe you have cried, and you have cried, and you have cried, and you have cried, and you have shouted out to God, Where is justice? Where are you, God? And you haven't seen it. Here's what I want you to know today. I want you to know, first of all, that the Lord promises to be our refuge. He is always our shelter. He is always there for us. And He is always willing to bear us up on eagles' wings. He will protect you and He will carry you through this. You may not physically see the results of it. 
but he is always faithful to stay by your side and walk you through it. And furthermore, you can always, always, always guarantee that our God is just. He is never, like this judge in the parable, not just. He is never not faithful. Our God is never changing. He is the same God that he has always been and always will be. And what that means is that our just God does not ignore evil forever. In fact, he's not ignoring it at all. He's not ignoring your pain. He's not ignoring your hurt. He's not ignoring what is happening to you. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, he says that the destruction of the world is not ignored. He is watching and he is working. We may not always see it, but the most dangerous thing a Christian can do in the middle of their pain, in the middle of their hurt, in the middle of injustice, is to say, well, I guess the answer is no and I'll quit praying. No, we always keep on praying. We also trust the king as we continue in our passage. Not just because he is the one who rewards us with justice, but because he is the one who rewards the faithful with mercy. He rewards the faithful with mercy. We see in verses 9 through 14, we had some self-righteous dudes showed up. And they thought they were righteous primarily because culturally at that time, they thought if you were rich, like most of the Pharisees were, that you therefore were experiencing the Lord's blessing. And that therefore they must be righteous or they wouldn't be rich. They also thought, due to their strict adherence to the Jewish law and adding a bunch of laws to it that they also followed, that their good deeds therefore meant that they had it all together. You could tell that from the Pharisees' prayer. Listen to it. Pharisee was standing there and he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything that I get. That's a very me, 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 usually kind of prayer. Little Toby Keith reference for like three of you. Contrast his prayer here, which is all about himself and how great he is and how righteous he is with the prayer of the tax collector who can't even lift his eyes to the Lord because he is so desperate for the mercy of God to be felt in his life. He knows his status. He knows his sinfulness. He knows his wrong. And he continues to say, God, show me mercy. Holy God, give me your grace. The man is desperate. You can tell he's even beating his chest, which was culturally a sign of desperation at that time. And appearing desperate is something our world hates. Nobody wants to look desperate. We all got to look like we got it put together. Like we can handle it. Like we can take it on our own. But look through the Old Testament, brothers and sisters. The biblical model is one of being desperate. When Cain was cursed by God, he was desperate. When Hagar was cast out of the family, she was desperate. When Moses was in the wilderness, he was desperate. When David was on the run from Saul, he was desperate. When Elijah was in the wilderness, he was desperate. When Jonah was in Nineveh, he was desperate. When Job was going through his suffering, he was desperate. When Jeremiah got thrown in a hole for preaching the gospel, he was desperate. When they shipwrecked with Paul, they were desperate. And I ask you, are you desperate for mercy? For his righteousness and his working in your life. Are you desperate for that? Amen. Because I don't feel it. I don't see it in our churches. I don't see and I don't feel desperation. I had an old retired pastor ask me the other day, when was the last time you saw people weeping over their sinfulness in church? And I said, brother, I've never seen that. 
This man here was raw, emotional. Do you imagine if we had someone in a worship service at church striking their chest and crying out to God, show me mercy, we'd have him committed. We'd have the safety team watching him. That man's a threat. He's crazy. He's off his rocker. No, he's seeking God in a way that we are too selfish and distracted to do ourselves. We desire to look good like we've got it together, like we're good Christian people, instead of people who are sinners desperately in need of a Savior. This is a daily need, Christian. Your salvation is not something that you needed God one night at vacation Bible school when you were 12, and now you've got it all together. No, you need God in His mercy, His forgiveness, His grace every minute of every day. And we've got to look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we desperate for the mercy of God? Is the way that we worship here evidence that we are desperate to experience His grace? The way that we sing, the way that we pray, the way that we study the Word, is it out of desperation to see God or is it out of a desire to look good? Out of a desire to go through the motions? Out of a desire to keep the family happy? Out of a desire to do what you do because it's Sunday and you go to church? Is the way that we have prayer meetings here at church a desire to see the working of God in our lives or a desire to gossip and keep up with who's sick in the community. When our only prayer lists are that so-and-so has got a cold and we cannot come to our brothers and sisters and pray about the things that hurt our hearts, about our need to see God, we have got a problem, y'all. The prayer meeting in the church used to be a time where Christians came together and they poured their hearts out before God with their brothers and sisters. Worship on Sunday mornings is meant to be a time to do that. And both are entirely too full of walking through the motions. Look, there are good and right things that happen in our churches in Sunday mornings and in prayer meetings. And praying for the sick is certainly important. I never want to act like it's not. But when was the last time you came to worship with the people of God? And something that I have talked about is supposed to be a time where we are gathering as if we are at the throne of the Lord in the new Jerusalem. And we have cried out, Spirit, come down. We must seek Him. Mercy got us here and mercy is what keeps us here. And as we trust the king for mercy, and as we trust the king for justice, we also trust the king for he rewards his faithful with security. We see him talked about the children, the opposite of self-trust in these parables, and then we see a man who's trusting in himself. He's followed all the commands. He's done it all right. So how do I get eternal life? How do I find security forever? Jesus. And Jesus says, give away all you have. See, the man wanted to trust in eternal security through Jesus, but he wanted to keep his now security in his own hands. And you don't get to do both. You're either trusting in Jesus now and forever, or you're not. You're either relying on him with everything you've got, or you're not. That man had followed all these commands. He'd lived so righteously, but he couldn't trust Jesus for his comfort and security. He had to trust his worldly riches for that. And Jesus calls him on it. That it is all or nothing. You're either in it or you're not. He points out that it's nearly impossible for the wealthy to be saved. And I'll just point out, you might be thinking you're not wealthy. If you are an American citizen, you are almost surely in the top 1% of the world's wealth. You are wealthy. Even if you're like, I don't believe that at all. You are. And you'll notice even the disciples asked him, they were like, well, we've done that, right? And Jesus is like, yeah, you did. You did leave what you had. And that's the point of all this at the end of the day is that we leave what we have and we give it all to God, right? 
They ask him, how can, how can we be saved? How is this possible? If you can't do it by seeking justice, if you can't do it by doing right deeds, if you can't do it with your wealth, how can we get through this life? How can we find peace and justice and mercy and security in this life? And Jesus says, with man it is impossible, but with God it is possible. He is the author, the perfecter, the source, the sustainer, the object, the center, the focus of your faith. And the only way to justice, mercy, redemption, security, provision is only through Jesus. That's it. It's only in throwing all of your weight, all of your trust, all of your focus, all of your openness, all of your heart to Jesus Christ as Lord. And I am talking to you. This is not about the person on the pew with you. This is not about the neighbor you're thinking about right now. I'm talking about you. Have you trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior? And are you living it? Because if you're not living it, you might have never done it. You're either in it or you're not. The disciples did it. Verses 28 through 30. They Left it all and followed Jesus. And they didn't do it perfectly. We're not going to do it perfectly. But they did it. And they ultimately followed the one who did it perfectly. Verses 31 through 34. Jesus talks about how he is the one. Who would go to Jerusalem. Who would be beaten. Who would be spit on. Who would be mocked. Who would be crucified. And who would die. Because that's what his father told him to do. You think Jesus didn't know? That Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant was about him. And that he had much pain to go through. He absolutely knew that. And yet he still trusted his father and followed through. You think he didn't know that Psalm 22 was about the sufferings that he would go through? You think he didn't know that Psalm 22 is what he would quote as he hung from the cross and took the penalty and weight of sin for eternity? He absolutely did. When Jesus was a child learning Psalm 22, he knew exactly what that psalm was talking about. And for the rest of his life, he still trusted his father in it. He trusted his father for mercy, for justice, for security, for resurrection, for reward. And the question is, do you? We can humble ourselves today, and we can trust in the risen king, the one who trusted his father all the way to the cross and into the resurrection, or we can trust in something else. We can either hit the eject button, leave this life, and go to the one trusting in God for it all, or we can keep on riding. Can't do both. We're going to get an opportunity to think about that as we go into the Lord's Supper now. As our deacons come forward, I want you to think on what the Lord's Supper symbolizes. It symbolizes that cross that Jesus knew was coming. It symbolizes his body broken and his blood poured out that he knew was coming. And yet he trusted his father through it anyway. It's a sacred thing. It's an image of trust that we see here. Are you trusting in him? As we pass out the elements, I want you to think. I want you to reflect on who you trust.
David, would you pray over the, our observance of the Lord's Supper for us? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, we see a description of the Lord's Supper, of God's mercy that we so desperately need, of His justice that He took act on on His Son, His security that He brings us through the act of the crucifixion, the death of Jesus. It says, on the night that He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise, the new dispension, disbursement. Of mercy and justice and security on our lives. What was, it, what was it sealed in? It was sealed in his blood. It was poured out for us. And so we do this as often as we drink it. In remembrance of him. For as often as we eat this bread and we take this cup. We proclaim the Lord's death. Until he comes again. And the question he asked in our passage today was when the son of man comes will he find faith and I ask you today when the Lord Jesus comes if he came right now would he find faith in your heart Dan's going to come and he's going to sing us in a song of response and as he does that I want you to ask yourself I want you to think to yourself do I trust this Jesus do I trust in the risen king who brings about justice and mercy and security or am I trusting in someone or something else? The altar will be open if you want to come and talk to somebody. I'll be down here. Our deacons will be here if you'd like to pray with one of us. Or if you'd just like to kneel by yourself before the altar and pray, that's fine too. If you'd like to talk to someone about what it means to trust in this Jesus... I'll be down front. We've got a prayer room in the back. If you're too nervous to come up front, slip to the back. Everybody will be looking forward. You just slip to the back. Go to the prayer room. You can talk to someone there about what it means to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can talk to someone about what it means to become a member of a church or to be baptized and how that's a step of declaring your trust to the world. Whatever it is you need to do, this is your time of response. If you need to go. And respond in some other way, then go. But as Dan sings, don't let this moment pass you by. Let's stand. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagle ascending. Victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong. Victory. 
The victory is yours. Christian, do you believe the victory is yours? Amen. Because if it is, that means you can be strong in the Lord. You can trust in him. And no matter what you face, you are victorious. I want to thank you all for being here with us this morning. Of course, I encourage you, please stay and uh, eat with us over in the fellowship hall. It's just right next door. If you need help finding it, we ha will be happy to help you locate it. Uh, please ask me or someone else, and we will, we will point you in the right direction. Uh, that way we can go eat together, fellowship with one another, spend some time talking to one another, and uh, support our youth ministry all at the same time. Of course, tonight at 6 o'clock, we encourage you to come back. Uh, we've got uh, Christian Davis coming to, to lead us in worship. It'll be a powerful night of worship, I have no doubt. And so, Lord willing, I uh, hope to see you tonight at that time. We also plan to have personnel and stewardship meetings tonight at 5, deacons meeting following the worship concert at 7. And so we got a busy day here on the grounds. Uh, it's a good day to be with the people of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Eddie. We're going to let you come back up on stage. you believe that? Will you pray to close us out, brother? I sure will. Thank you. And let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this beautiful day that you've given us. We're thankful for another opportunity to be in, in your house. We're thankful for the message that's been presented this morning. And we pray, Lord, that we would carry that over into the day and into the week this week to find us uh, comforting yet challenging, Lord. And we ask you to bless the food that we, uh, as we go next door, that it would nourish and, and uh, strengthen our bodies. And we can come back tonight to enjoy the concert. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow.